Hey Wolfpack, and welcome back. I hope you all had a great week. Mine's been quite busy, so I'm sorry I haven't been around that much in the Discord either. Today, we're doing three more serial killer encounters. With that said, whether you're sitting around a campfire, on the night shift, or even laying in bed, let my voice soothe your nightmares. I am a notorious serial killer in my city. Twelve had died for my knife, and I... I am... I happy about it. Not exactly. But as long as I don't get caught, it doesn't matter, right? Never mind that, though. This is the story of the first duo killing I have ever done. Yes, believe it or not, killers group together and murder people. Double the people, double the fun. It starts in the cold winter of 2008, probably around January or February. My duo partner and I were sitting in the basement of this family's home. Poor souls. They forgot to lock the basement's back door. We walked in and waited about 30 minutes after we had heard their living room TV turn off before we started going upstairs. Now, I want to clear some things up. Murderers don't wear massive boots and doors. We also don't wear masks. Why, you ask? We don't need to hide our identity if we don't intend on leaving any witnesses. I also don't kill any children. They can actually do something that can improve people's lives, but their parents are useless bags of blood to me. I never want to leave them in a Batman-like life, but you gotta do what you gotta do. If you don't understand, let me explain. Serial killers are actually just government tests, kinda like hitmen but for the government. Now, of course there are real serial killers who don't work for the government, but we aren't those people. We kill, we scare, and we make people take risks. We fuel the economies in some cities. If everyone lives life like it's their last day on Earth, productivity skyrockets. But back to the story. We cut the power to the house and began our move. Before we went up the stairs, we took off our shoes. You are so much quieter wearing just socks. After we went up the stairs and went to look for hallways, hallways meaning at least one bedroom in most family homes, the downstairs seemed pretty empty, so we walked upstairs. This is where we started noticing things. Decorations on doors are a dead giveaway. On one side, we found two doors. One with the normal edgy teenaged boy stickers like Girls Not Allowed, professional gamer inside, and another door with live, laugh, love on it. The other side had a newborn inside sticker on it. It always gave me a chuckle knowing that they just gave away their location, and ultimately, as long as they are older than 18, their life. Of course, we didn't kill the children since they were obviously younger than 18. We have our morals, but the parents are a whole different story, as I said before. After walking in their room, which we luckily chose on the first try, we quickly finished them off. We hung the bodies halfway off the window they had next to their bed, so the neighbors can see them and call the police. If we are there to scare people, then we gotta get our crimes found and spread, and headed our way. We turned for the door, and we froze. An eight-foot-tall goblin-like creature stood there before us. Its skin was gray like wet paper. One of its eyes were the deepest black I have ever seen. It reminded me of a miniature black hole, while the other was a glowing white. I'm sick of you government scums. You waste my time. It said in the lowest, raspiest voice I'd ever heard. What? What is that? Murmured my duo. Death incarnate. Now... You'll both die like your little victims, since I'm tired of carrying your unneeded shedding of blood, the goblin said. My duo ran. He forgot protocol. We were told we would have seen this when we started the training of being what we are today. The goblin, who was actually death incarnated, whipped a chain at my duo, a lassoed over his ankle, and quickly grabbed a hold, effectively tripping him. 
the goblin pulled him over and started beating him with his club. Which was one thing pop culture got correct about goblins. The hundred pound wooden branch was quickly whipped by the beefy goblin leaving a severed head, which resembled a popped balloon in its impact. Useless now, aren't you? Chuckled Death. I knew now was the time to run. I quickly jumped out of the bloody window, narrowly escaping the dead bodies in which the window had balanced on its opening, and ran. I quickly got into the headquarters, got into the entrance, and ran in. The place was ransacked. Bodies laid everywhere and badly beaten. I looked up to the hundreds of pairs of eyes. Half of them were on the same, soul-sucking black. The other half, glowing enough to see the culprits of the massacre that laid before me. I turned to run, but bump into some leathery wall. That's when I noticed I screwed up, because that leathery wall I ran into simply said, in the same raspy voice I heard ten minutes ago, Hello. I have no idea how I got out of there, but I did. I'm writing this to inform the public that they will be suffering an end way worse than death, and literal gods will be behind it. It was late at night, and we were driving up to the family cottage when the first police car came up behind us on the highway. My wife didn't see it at first, and she made a surprise noise before pulling over to the side of the single lane highway. We slowly came to a stop on the gravel shoulder and the cop car sped past us, the airstream buffeting us to the side. It was going very fast, I thought, even for a cop car with its lights and siren on. After a few moments, my wife pulled back onto the road. It was odd to see a police car, or any vehicle for that matter, this late at night on the Highway 7. It was 3 o'clock in the morning, and that had been the first car we'd seen for a while. After driving for a few more minutes, she exclaimed again and pulled over quickly. This time, nearly a dozen police cars drove past. We watched them go in astonishment. What on earth would go on to cause such a response? We live in Canada, so murders and gun crimes are uncommon. My first thought was an arson, or perhaps a drug bust. But that didn't seem right for the amount of cars in that time of night. The thought of a murderer on the loose didn't even cross my mind, at least not at the time. We kept driving, and she pulled over three more times to let police cars go by, each time more than a few cops sped past at high speeds. All told, about 30 of the squad cars went by before we saw the last of them. The stereo had nothing but static for the most part, and Twitter was silent on the subject. When I used the intermittent data service on my phone to check for police news in the area, it was a small community so the local police department didn't even have a Twitter account, I noticed. By the time we got to the cottage, we were both exhausted. As I've described here before, our family cabin is a long way off the beaten path. We were at the end of an isolated peninsula on a small lake. It takes 30 minutes of driving down treacherous back roads, some of which barely qualify as roads, to reach a quaint little shack. And that's after the four hour drive on freeways and single lane highways just to get into the area. The place was so dilapidated, we told people we were going camping when we went up there, even though it was technically a cottage. We pulled into the driveway, which was just a couple of tire tracks in the grass. I got out of the car and swatted mosquitoes as I pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight app. The lake was still and quiet, with only the sound of crickets and bullfrogs, and the odd coyote howl in the distance. It would be another couple of hours before the birds began to sing and the bass began to jump out of the water making unexpected splashing noises. I went up the rickety wooden stairs to the front door and put the key in the lock, turning it with an effort, making a mental note to put a bit of lubricant on it before the end of the weekend. Stepping inside, I walked as I felt cobwebs on my face and felt something crawling on the back of my neck. I yelped and brushed the thing off of me, feeling a spider bite the back of my neck before I could get to it with my hand. I made a pained noise and said a quick prayer to Jesus asking him to prevent infection and or give me Spider-Man abilities. I heard something move in the darkness of the cabin. 
We had mice, so at first, I dismissed it as that. But then I took a second longer to process the sound. It had sounded larger than a mouse, whatever it was. Hello? I called into the cabin, my voice quivering. No one answered. I was worried momentarily that a raccoon had found its way in. It was possible. Especially now that I noticed a draft coming from the back room. Maybe a window had broken from a fallen tree branch, allowing wildlife inside, I thought. There was no electricity in the cabin, since I hadn't hooked up the marine battery to the inverter yet. I used the light of my phone as I walked in further, taking slow and tentative steps. My heart beat loud and fast in my ears. My mouth and throat felt dry, and my stomach felt fluttery and strange. Hello? I said again, still sensing another presence inside. Something with eyes, watching, waiting. I proceeded further and almost released the contents of my overfilled bladder into my pants when someone put their forearm around my neck, tightly choking me. I felt a cold steel blade dig into the flesh below my ear and a sting as it prodded past the superficial skin, drawing blood. Warmth trickled down the side of my neck and turned cold in the chilly night air. Not a sound. The voice behind me was not asking. It was a raspy sounding man, his smoker's voice totally devoid of emotion. Not a sound at all, or I will kill you. Tell your woman to come inside. My wife came in, saying something about how tired she was, and then dropped what she was carrying and screamed. She stood frozen in the doorway, mosquitoes flying in past her, the car headlights making her into a silhouette, a caricature of a scared person. Her hands were up at the sides of her face and her legs shook. She tried to say something, but stammered and stopped. I'm going to take your car, the man said. Give me your keys. I looked at my wife and tried to tell her to give the man the keys, but my voice didn't work. Another person was in the room, I noticed suddenly. There was a young teenage girl in the shadows, behind the couch on the floor. She rocked back and forth silently in the darkness. The knife dug further into my neck, and I cried out in pain. The keys! He said again. They're in the car. My wife managed, her voice just above a whisper. Your phones. He said. Again, not a question. I handed my phone to him, my only source of light. There were flashlights scattered around the cabin, but the batteries inside would be questionable at best. We would be left in utter blackness, without a car. But that was the least of our concerns at the moment. My wife put her phone on the ground and kicked it over to him, after he told her to do so. He told her to move away from the door, and she came inside and stood in the kitchen. Now, we were at an impasse. He would have to let me go if he wanted to take the girl with him, the one crying in the corner. I felt a wave of sorrow for her, knowing the feeling of just one minute at the mercy of this terrible man. His voice was inhuman and monstrous. He took the knife away from the side of my neck quickly and stabbed it into my thigh, up to the hilt. I screamed and fell to the floor, writhing in pain and rolling back and forth. The agony was so intense I couldn't catch my breath, and felt for a moment that I would lose consciousness. I stayed awake though, and felt fresh pain as the man reached down and pulled the knife out of my leg, blood splurting high into the air and all over his face drenching him in my blood. He laughed and looked down at me, his face crimson red and dripping, except for the whites of his eyes and his smiling teeth. He wiped the blade of the knife on his shirt, carefully and methodically. He didn't think about my wife, still behind him. He had called her my woman, but he didn't know what a badass she actually was. My wife had been taking a lot of classes. Since our run-in with the locals, our last time up at the cottage, she wanted to prepare if we ran into trouble again here, and had become obsessed with self-defense, and jiu-jitsu in particular. She had previously obtained a purple belt in BJJ, but was now even more dedicated, 
quickly progressing to a black belt in record time. She jumped up into the air and managed to get her right leg up over his arm, the one that held the knife. A flying arm bar is a difficult maneuver to pull off, especially against a taller opponent. But she had been practicing like it was a full-time job. I had spent many nights as her practice dummy. She wrapped her arms around the man's wrist and yanked backwards with all her body strength. She had been working out and managed to break his arm with a loud snap. I'm sure the adrenaline pumping through her veins helped to maximize her torque, as I had never seen her so successful against a larger opponent. She had also caught him completely by surprise. I heard Marbone's crack as she pulled back even further, not relenting at just one broken bone. The man screamed and howled as his ulna and radius broke in multiple places. His shoulder popped out of the socket farther and farther. I heard another loud snap. His humorous, maybe? I thought we had him beat, then. But just as he had been caught by surprise, so were we. The girl who I thought was his prisoner suddenly appeared behind my wife and pulled her off the man, screaming and swiping at her. She had a knife as well, I saw with alarm. It was smaller, but she had it tightly gripped in her fist. The light cast by my cell phone, which lay haphazardly on the floor, illuminated the scene at times, but it was mostly shrouded by darkness. I couldn't see what was happening, as I held tight pressure on my wound. I pulled off my shirt and wrapped it around my leg as a tourniquet, trying to make a futile effort to ignore my blood loss and get up to help. The man was no longer writhing on the floor. He had a furious look on his face, and his arm hung limply at his side. I was suddenly terrified as I watched him get up to his knees, shakily, and try to stand. He fell once, face planting with a loud smack into the wooden floor. It seemed not to affect him though, as he just got back up to one knee again. Then I saw him in the dim light, what he was reaching for. His knife was laying on the floor, just out of reach. He was trying to crawl over to it. In the darkness, I heard the two women fighting. It was starting to sound like my wife was getting the better of the younger girl, who was fighting like a wild woman. She had been screaming and sticking her with a tiny knife again and again, but was going to lose steam and slow down, her arms suddenly heavy and tired. My wife finally got a hold of her arm and twisted it backwards, dislocating the young girl's shoulder. She fell to the floor in a heap, holding her arm and making hurt animals like noises. The man was just about to reach the knife, I realized. I shouted to my wife and told her to look out. She saw, but just at a moment too late. She was going to try and kick the man in the chin as he reached for the knife, but he saw her and the last second pulled away. She slipped on the floor, which was slick with far too much blood. As her foot missed his face and the force of her kick lifted her off her feet, she fell down hard on her shoulders and neck but didn't stay down for long. She got up covered in blood and tried to avoid the man as he slashed at her with a knife. My wife backed up into the kitchen counter and felt around behind her for a weapon. She found one. The man came at her and lunged. She sidestepped out of the way and he went past her, flying all of his body weight into the kitchen counter. He looked like he had the wind knocked out of him and was stunned for a moment. That was when my wife hit him in the back of the head with a frying pan hard. He collapsed to the floor and the girl ran over to him, screaming at us. I managed to get up to my knee and grabbed my phone. I held it in the girl's eyes, blinding her with a bright light. She covered her face and cursed at me, her voice pure rage. She cradled her arm, looking to find despite her injuries. I picked up the knife the man had dropped and managed to get up on one leg. I held onto the wall for support and told my wife we needed to go now. She agreed and we limped out of there together. We got into the car and drove away, hearing the girl's insane voice from behind us, calling after us manically. We're going to find you, you know. Don't think you've won, because you ain't won shit. He's gonna wake up and guess what? He'll be coming for you next. You ain't beat us. You ain't shit. You're gonna die. 
You're going to die. You hear me? We found out the next day, when we read the paper, just what had happened. The man was a cannibalistic serial killer, and the girl was his brainwashed accomplice and underage protege. The authorities had found human remains from multiple victims buried in his backyard, and had initiated a manhunt for him after he disappeared. That's why all the cop cars had passed us on the highway, on the way up to the cottage. It was just our luck he picked our isolated cabin at the end of the peninsula. Far away from prying eyes, the chances were one in a million, conservatively. He had been hiding there for just a few hours when we stumbled upon him. The worst part is, I know he's not dead, and he hasn't been caught. We called the police, but they managed to get away before they could get there. They are both trained hunters and survivalists. I've found out since, so they know how to get by in the wild. I only hope the police manage to catch them before they can find us. I'm worried because I know there's a few things in the cabin that could have identified us. A fire permit which bore my mother's name hung from a board in the living room. The police say it wasn't there when they checked the cabin. I've gotten a new security system and additional locks on my doors, but I don't know if we can prevent the inevitable. It might be time I started taking jujitsu classes with my wife. Before we start the story, I would like to say, please go check out this author's book on Amazon. It's called, First Do No Harm, by P.F. McGrail. I actually have Kindle Unlimited, and it's pretty good so far. I highly recommend it. The link for it will be in the description down below. With that said, let's jump into the story. I had to weep silently, so the little boy would not hear me from inside his closet. The tears absolutely ruined my clown makeup but I was not going to come out until dark. So, he probably wouldn't notice. And even if he did, that would just make it creepier. It was hard to breathe in such a cramped space. I'm very claustrophobic, but there could be no deviation from the instructions. Not if I wanted my wife to eat again this week. Daddy, the clown is back in my closet. The boy complained from across the room. A man groaned. Damn it, Timmy. There's no clown in your stupid closet. I've checked every night this week, and it's getting old fast. A silence lingered that could only indicate the challenging and electric bond that defined an unspoken gaze between father and son. He sighed. This is the last time I'm checking, Timmy. I swear, you're six years old. You shouldn't be afraid of the closet anymore. I held my breath and buried my head in his dirty clothes. My hand wrapped around the can of gasoline beneath my knees. Words cannot describe how much I feared to use it, but my instructions were clear. If I were ever discovered by an adult, the entire house gets burned to the ground. No one escapes, no survivors, not even me. The door opened. See? Nothing but the dirty laundry that your mother told you three times to take downstairs. The door closed. More unspoken silence. Then, softer, Good night, champ. Big day at school tomorrow. The lights flicked off. In the dark, the past came back to me. Do you love me? Annie had asked. And I told her yes. The morning light was catching her stray. Wispy hair in a way that stood somewhere between careless and disheveled. How do I know you love me? She teased. And I didn't know what to say. The reality is that the first time I ever saw her, I was disappointed. My friend had promised to set me up with someone hot, but this tiny, mousy girl was average at best. In time, though, each physical feature had bound itself to an indelible memory. Her snub nose kept rubbing against my shoulder after the first time we made love. She could stick three flowers behind her wide, protruding ears, and her cerulean fingernails would slide deliciously through my hair when she reached both arms back while I was on top, and her face was buried in the pillow, begging me to go faster, and her fingernails would pull on my locks while I was almost there. I couldn't tell that I loved her for being the most beautiful person on earth, because I knew she wouldn't believe the truth. I played counting games, 
After 19 minutes and 13 seconds, I couldn't put it off any longer. I stood up and pulled the jar from behind me. I could feel it vibrating with energy, even if it was too dark to see inside. I hated myself for doing this, but rules had to be followed. So, I unscrewed the top and flipped the jar into his dirty clothes. With a soft thud, the mass landed and scattered. In the silence, I could almost hear it. A thousand freed cockroaches now were roaming this boy's closet. It would be weeks before they found every one. I struggled to put the clown nose on. It was difficult. I had slit the flesh of my nostril open, leaving spare flaps that would always crust over with scabs and boogers. The physical pain dulled, but never left. I didn't have any regrets, though. He'd given my wife two pints of oatmeal that week. I sat softly on the edge of his bed, making sure to pick a spot in the patch of moonlight streaming through the window. Though he was in the dark, I could tell by the glistening reflection of moonlight on his eyes that he was looking at me. Are you here to scare me again tonight, clown? I nodded, fervently, enough to bounce the bed. And my parents will never believe me if I tell them about you. I shook my head slowly. The soft crumpling of sheets told me that he was crawling toward the farthest corner of his race car bed. What? He hitched a sob. What are you going to make me do? He asked in the quietest whisper. With a trembling hand, I reached into my oversized clown pocket and produced a piece of Tupperware. I grabbed my own wrist to steady myself. Are you going to hurt my mom and dad if I don't do everything you say? He asked in a voice filled with more terror than any child should ever experience. I nodded dragging it on long enough to make sure there was no ambiguity. Then, I peeled the plastic lid back. My wife's beautiful finger lay inside, looking grotesquely out of place without her hand attached. Her cerulean nail polish, usually so exotic and mysterious, seemed so cold and dead. Pulling the meat from her bone had been one of the hardest things I have ever had to do. I was very glad I'd completed that task ahead of time. I picked a chunk of shredded flesh out of the Tupperware, staining my clean, white clown gloves a rusty red. Eat up, I growled. I leaned against the wall for another sleepless night of standing in the closet. The oversized tassels on my ridiculous outfit seemed to mock me as they bobbed up and down with my silent heaving sobs. I'd have ended myself long ago if it weren't for the threats of what he'd do to her. At least tonight was a success though. He had been watching the whole time. He makes me keep a tiny camera in my clown hat. I've been a good boy, so my wife would get to eat three times this week. Thanks for listening, Wolfpack. If you want to submit your own story, the links for my email and subreddit will be down below. I've also created a Discord, so if you want to join that, the link will be in the description down below as well. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And with that said, have beautiful nightmares, and I will see you next time.